Good morning. We're very excited for this presentation this morning. Uh, in this panel, we have a group of fascinating panelists who are going to take around this topic of how can technology be a gateway to our shared humanity? To set them some of the context, of course, technology has long had a role in improving the lives of individuals. Everything from the advent of mobile phones and technology to overcome the lack of landline infrastructure elsewhere, talking about the issue of financial technology has made leaps and bounds in people's access to capital and reducing inequality. And the last few years of the role of technology has been on the other side. The role of the large monopolies, Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, at least in the United States, uh, the share of large Chinese companies themselves, talk about having negative effects as well. And so the purpose of this panel is to take a step back. And as we emerge from a year of COVID and a year of unbearable and significant social upheaval pandemic, as we look back at the role of technology, uh, we're going to talk today about the role of technology as a gateway to shared humanity. And what we'd like to do is focus on a few areas that might be less appreciated that are different innovations that panelists here have some experience with and talk about how we might think more of it. Uh, given the panelists we have today and the terrific group, we're going to move right in to this, uh, it, right in into where we are and start out with each of the panelists uh, giving a few words of introduction and then offering their thoughts of some of this. Uh, what I'd like to do is make this very interactive, uh, at least in California, where early at 730 and to get the juices flowing in the brain and, and elsewhere to have please folks interrupt, jump in and add uh, and add their thoughts as we can move it. So without further ado, I'm really grateful we have two fantastic panelists joining. Uh, with this, when I turn to which of the two of you would like to start first, please introduce yourselves, and then we'll move in and start talking about uh, the uh, the substance of today's conversation. Okay. Well, I'll start maybe. Um, my name is Eli Amit. I'm heading uh, a design agency called New Deal Design. Uh, we've been dealing a lot with uh, consumer electronics meeting uh, medicine. Uh, the biggest uh, name on our belt is uh, Fitbit, which uh, is a product that uh, we designed uh, from uh, 2007 to 2017. Uh, we're still dealing a lot with the same topics. And um, yeah, I'll talk about it a little bit later. So uh, thanks. Nice to be here. Your microphone is off. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a bit fuzzy, um, but why don't I go ahead and make it a drop uh, and hopefully by the time you are able to come let me Let me just go ahead and get anything to Thank you for having us today. Uh, uh, myself, uh, my name is Karen. Uh, I'm based in the middle of the story. Uh, I'm getting some more you. Uh, I've been based in the Middle East uh, for approximately 20 years. Uh, spent some time in Australia and the UK. Uh, today, I'm work representing Robotics ME, a company I founded here focused on working with innovative technologies uh, and discussing one of our main partners, uh, FBR, who are essentially building the world's first robotic bricklaying machine, essentially allowing you to construct homes without a human hand being involved. So look forward to talking about that as well. Yes, we talk, but do you hear me? Yeah. We can break away, Matt. It's there. Hey. It's there. Boss Matt there. So I think until we wait for him to get back, uh, Gary, why don't uh, we start with yourself and just uh, maybe an opening point from your perspective on, on how do you see yourself interacting with this theme? Well, uh, thanks. Uh, I think it's the right thing to do until Matt comes back. So uh, long story short, I do think that uh, the giants in tech, uh, the digital tech, uh, really uh, managed to ruin... Uh, <laughs> A technology for a lot of people uh, through all their uh, gated communities and uh, gated garden uh, perceptions. But in, a, in essence, um, 
uh, distribution of digital technology is one of the easiest uh, things to do when we're talking about on a global level. Uh, you could manufacture quite a lot of uh, these uh, tiny uh, wow. uh, semi-medical devices or quite medical devices and, and distribute them in millions to uh, areas of neglect uh, where medical infrastructure uh, never arrived. And with that, you could definitely uh, provide a lot of um, uh, medical services uh, more remotely using a system where you have sensors and uh, nodes, if you wish, that are small and inexpensive in remote areas connected to uh, central uh, medical hubs where experts could be analyzing data and, and really uh, support people from, from afar. And if we talk about, uh, you know, shared humanity, I think uh, health is one of the, if not the most uh, uh, humanistic uh, value we should promote. And uh, this is something that could be, uh, you know, much uh, supported by uh, digital technology uh, on a global level. <clears throat> Scotty, can I try again? Can can folks hear me now? Yep, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Enough. Thanks. We can deal with healthcare, but we can't figure out how to broadcast a stream on AirPods. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Scotty, it's fascinating what you said. I mean, take us forward ten years. I mean, where is this technology going in a way that we might not imagine right now? Well, I'll tell you uh, something that uh, is quite. Uh, uh, you know, current, if you wish, but uh, its uh, manifestation will probably happen in a few years. Uh, there are people who are dying from cardiac, uh, cardiac arrest uh, all over the world. And uh, there is a device, a, a portable fibrillator, that is easy to use and um, could be uh, applied uh, by any human and could uh, apply shocks uh, automatically. And the biggest problem with this device that so far has been uh, very uh, bulky and expensive and therefore rare, but uh, latest technology allows it to be a lot smaller, nearly on a level of every house uh, household could have one. And that could change uh, life for many, many people. And uh, that's something that is really doable. Uh, another uh, uh, element, for instance, uh, prenatal care. Uh, the ability to create ultrasound uh, or uh, monitor pregnancy from uh, from afar. These are uh, small um, uh, nuggets of, of high quality care that could be uh, easily distributed through um, uh, digital uh, technology, both hardware and software. Um, they are kind of stuck in the pipeline, if you wish, and I believe they'll come to full fruition within the five, 10 years. And Guy, you said they're stuck in the pipeline. I mean, I have two questions. Is that yeah. due to just the difficulty of the technology? Are there regulatory reasons? Are there things that we can use to push those obstacles away? The, the technology itself in its raw form is, is an, it, it has been developed. Uh, stuck, in the, stuck in the pipeline, uh, I'm, I'm including uh, financing these uh, ventures, uh, getting uh, through the regulatory pipeline, uh, scaling up, uh, uh, reducing costs to some degree, and distributing uh, globally. Uh, this is the pipeline. It, it takes uh, usually for a, an innovation uh, about five years to uh, come through uh, you know, the, the, the pipeline until it's uh, distributed and you could find it in, you know, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So something like that is, is what I'm talking about. And, and that's something that could be uh, done and should be done. Uh, amazingly, when you're looking at, at um, kind of a macroeconomics, the numbers associated with global distribution of technology like that is actually, uh, the numbers are quite, uh, quite low. You know, a billion dollar could make a huge change in, in uh, uh, pregnancy health uh, through the, the, the entire planet. Uh, so these are the type of uh, numbers and speeds that I'm talking about. Absolutely. Karan, what's, what's, I mean, you mentioned robotics earlier. What, what strikes you as, as, as we look towards, you know, 10 years, what, what is actually we could see that we're not right now? Sure. Thanks. Thanks for Gary. I think, uh, Matt, sorry. And thanks for your, um, insight there, Gary. I think 
the way I look about look at sort of technology and the intersection between humanity's needs is basically through the model of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, if you're familiar with that, um, you've essentially got basic needs, food, water, warmth, rest at the bottom, security, relationships, prestige, accomplishment, and eventually self-actualization. So probably your basic uh, security needs at the bottom, and then, you know, uh, your, your, your call to purpose, et cetera, at the, at the top. And I think if you look at sort of civilization in the past 100 years through that lens, you can see that the real major impact, uh, the Nobel Prize winners in technology, et cetera, uh, in, in the space of leveraging technology, have come through meeting psychological needs. And I think that in the next 10 years, what we'll see is that more and more of the world will have the psychological needs met, sorry, the, the physiological needs met, and moving towards you know, a sense of belonging, sense of self-esteem, and sense of self-actualization. So what are technologies that focus on self-actualization? Um, I would see technologies that enable art. A company would be Canva, for example, and what they're doing. Um, you know, companies like YouTube that are, or, or Patreon that are allowed to get um, artists or creators out, getting their content out there and inspiring others to do the same. But when he's focusing on physiological needs, where I spend a lot more of my time uh, in, in the construction space is just building homes as cheaply, as quickly as possible. Um, I think there's there's huge impact there with an mm -hmm. idea of uh, in the next 10 years seeing entire homes or, or uh, communities being built without the need of humans to build faster, cheaper, and with less waste. That's where I see that's, that's uh, good. So that, that home building piece is fascinating. Do you see that if homes can be, as you said, faster, better, and cheaper, is that something that we can see more in the developing world? as Gotti talked about, or do we first see that begins maybe more in areas of Western Europe, North America that are facing inequality, or does it happen at the same time? How do you think about the, the deployment of that technology? Look, I think that's a great question, and that's entirely driven by who's funding the technology. If you've got your, you know, uh, quote-unquote capitalists or venture capitalists, you're essentially focused on uh, building a profit immediately, and that would go towards the developed economies where you've got the cost of labor being close to $20 to $30 an hour uh, versus, let's say, 5 to $10 in terms of the cost of machinery, not worrying about insurance costs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's where you'd see the technology go. And also because in developed economies, you're seeing a decline in young people joining, you know, industries that have dangerous jobs, let's say construction. So there could be an easy matchup there. Um, if you have uh, the right infrastructure in place in the form of, NGOs, uh, maybe the United Nations or sort of uh, international aid organizations funding communities, then you would see, I think, that technology being applied immediately uh, to uh, developing areas. So one example, which I, can, I think could uh, work very well, would be in disaster relief zones. So the idea that you have an earthquake or a flood, obviously you don't have access to appropriate labor or tools at the same time at, at that moment. Uh, you could ship in technology, fly in technology, like robots that can build homes, uh, like gantry systems to assemble homes uh, using local materials and essentially build shelters immediately. So those are the two areas, uh, two ways I could see that being accomplished in both developed and developing worlds. You know, it's, it's interesting when you mentioned the types of funding, this is something we should take up later on this session is you're right. It's it, it, there, there are two pieces of at least when I was in venture capital, I struggled with on the one hand, you're right. There's a profit motive amongst venture capital firms who have so many, great ideas, but can't be executed. So you have, you know, 10% success rates in a portfolio at best, meaningfully. Uh, and that becomes more sustainable. And then our international aid organizations try very hard, but the United States and others have been so reluctant to fund them. How do we strike the balance between that? You know, I mean, one, one company that you might be familiar with, Zipline, uh, they do drone delivery in Africa. Uh, an interesting story, but one thing that they've done is Early funding projects were from the Gates Foundation. Otherwise, that's where they're able to do things for Rwanda. But to really be a sustainable company and to grow into their enormous ambitions, they need to be doing package and other delivery in North America and yeah. the United States. So they're an example of, sort of flipping the script uh, yeah. a little on the on the other side. Um, you know, one one thing that I would just add as a moderator privilege is, I mean, we've talked about health, uh, prenatal care, and heart attacks. Uh, Karan, you talked about homes and shelter. These are basic human needs. You know, another area that I found interesting is agriculture and food systems. Yep. You know, right now, 
if we look at the global food systems, when I was when I was at the White House, I was part of an effort that we called Feed the Future. When we tried to think about how do you, for the first time, really think about reducing hunger and access to food globally. Sure. The issue, of course, as we know, is that as uh, incomes rise, as meat consumption becomes more and more attractive, both because people really like meat and it's a sign of prestige, that in industrial agriculture then becomes the largest contributor to carbon emissions, even more than all transportation combined. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I found very interesting is thinking about the role of cell-based uh, and plant-based meat. You know, yep. probably by now, it's not a unique thing to say I've had an Impossible Burger or a Beyond Sausage. But now there have been a number of very interesting companies would have introduced the idea that we can actually have an actual chicken without killing a chicken through the horrible conditions of animal slaughter and the huge mm -hmm. inefficiency you have by using a chicken as a food production biological mm -hmm. factory. Uh, you know, probably folks have seen one company is actually selling them in Singapore right now, a company called Good Meat Company. And that strikes me as one of the new things as we think about the food systems evolving, that's a piece of technology that are changing things, right? You can, the analogy is that I think of is, we all wanna reduce energy. You can reduce energy by having a hall monitor in everyone's house telling them to turn off the bathroom lights when they leave, or you can start investing in energy efficient light bulbs and, and moving into some of that. Is this something that that either Gotti or or, or Khan that you you come across in some of your investments and and your travels as well? I'm not sure if you have a perspective on this. I mean, I, I ran into the artificial food and and food production uh, multiple times. Uh, there, uh, one thing I want to emphasize here that uh, no matter what, you still need uh, the or let's say the the core ingredients. Uh, either for an artificial uh, meat or something else. So uh, we still need agriculture. It cannot be done just in a, a factory. So you need ingredients. Um, one of the biggest problems uh, or inefficiency in agriculture is the need to uh, survey and, and take care of uh, very uh, large uh, plots of land. There are a lot of inefficiencies in irrigation along that uh, plot. Uh, some some plants get more, some plants get less water. So these, again, could be uh, monitored and, and optimized through digital technologies. I, I do think that there is uh, a lot to be done in um, construction techniques in terms of insulation. Uh, we've been dealing with that a little bit too, uh, Karan, and that's... Uh, Part of the problem we have in uh, in the northern countries is that we got used to uh, construction that are actually very low on insulation. So uh, it, it includes not only the material but also the type of architecture. Uh, I'm I'm living in a quintessential uh, Californian uh, home that has a lot of windows and a lot of uh, uh, openings, and sometimes it's super hot here in the Middle East. Usually, you'll see houses that are uh, sheltered from the sun, uh, trying to, to do things uh, naturally without uh, massive uh, uh, AC attached and so on. So, yeah, uh, there is a, a lot to be done in terms of, uh, you know, getting uh, back into equilibrium with uh, nature and, uh, uh, you know, the, the biggest forces in, in, in nature. So, yeah. Gotti, it's an interesting point there is, is, is you know, it, it's easy, especially for those of us who live in Silicon Valley to talk about software is eating the world. But yeah. there is a point where you need physical manufacturing, of course. This is a I, I'm, I, I'm on that camp. I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I came from the physical side. I'm trying to tell software guys that there is a need for physical uh, wisdom, you know. <laughs> there is. And supply chain and manufacturing, look, it's great to have every app or the marginal yeah. cost of each new production is great. But at some point... You people, as you said, I think, Karan, about their, their hierarchy of needs. Shelter is, of course, one of the top. And you can, uh, Karan, you look like you were going to jump in thinking about sort of the, this, this physical part as well. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of add on or to, to Gary's point, and I think as, as a design that he it probably resonates with him, is that uh, I think more and more we need to see more design uh, philosophies applied when it comes to, I think, what you were touching on, Matt, in terms of entire ecosystems being developed to be to actually use technology well, uh, it has to be used smartly. So I'll give you an example in terms of construction space. Gary touched on in terms of our homes that are built in the Middle East. 
you don't see homes or you rarely see homes with floor ceiling windows uh, here. Uh, why? Because it's just energy inefficient. Sure, we can put up ACs and we can afford it with uh, what used to be a relatively low oil price. But that's not how we'd uh, want to um, essentially execute on it. And I think that that's testament to the leadership um, of some of the, I would say, uh, less democratically enabled countries you've seen during the COVID times. That, uh, relatively authoritarian governments have uh, managed to, you know, uh, handle themselves well. Uh, I'm speaking to Singapore and, and the UAE uh, as, as two examples uh, where when a restriction when was placed uh, with regards to not moving around COVID, no one really complained and uh, we, COVID was able to be managed, again, relatively. Uh, I think what that speaks to is essentially, to, uh, to your point around agriculture, for example, is if the governments or the Raj institutional players get involved early enough, if things are designed with local tastes and preferences uh, in mind um, and possibilities in mind, then I think technology acts as an accelerator rather than the driver of change, if, if that makes sense. So that's a fascinating point. I mean, you're right. There, there's a government role to direct some of that, but also in the private sector, I assume you're saying can continue to lift it and drive it and make it more sustainable. Can you give an example of how that will work because, or, or where you've seen that work well? Because that's a very complicated and important struggle. You know, the right between center directed, which unfortunately command and control governments have failed at often the United States government, a key example, unfortunately, versus filling that gap that you mentioned there. I think it's a fascinating point. I'd love to know some examples of where you think you've seen it work well. Sure. Thank you for that. Um, look, I think so. In, in my experience, I've spent time in, in the UK and Australia in India and in the UAE. So my sort of experience and network is predominantly around uh, the Pacific area. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll take uh, Australia as an example. Uh, so when it came to, let's say, infrastructure projects, I'm uh, not sure if you guys have been to Australia recently, uh, but we were lagging probably the last sort of big infrastructure build we did was probably about 30 years ago. Something similar to, I, think, I guess, relative to Australia, what Biden is looking to come up with his infrastructure, you know, completely re-energizing, reinvigorating the economy. Um, we're recently going through that in the last 12 months right now, especially with covid uh, exports being hampered in Australia, education se sector almost, uh, you know, going down, going down to zero, uh, including tourism as well. So with that coming in, you've now seen a huge push or a huge upliftment, not just in building materials and, and sort of uh, construction processes, but also in things like IoT, uh, you know, mm -hmm. new design methodologies for the construction sector uh, to be more environmentally efficient uh, and bring the average cost of maintenance down for, let's say, the construction space. Um, to, to speak to your point around agriculture and what's happening over there, um, with COVID, I think there was a big realization that international uh, supply chains are not going to be are not robust. So what's happening right now is you've seen regional supply chains expanded. What that means in the UAE on the Saudi region is that you've seen essentially hydroponic centers being invested in. Uh, before, they were just a, a talking point. But now uh, they're seen as a, cr a critical part of the regional economies, uh, food infrastructure, mm. manufacturing domestically, um, you know, so, so solar energy to fund essentially cooled, climate controlled hydroponic centers that are able to produce uh, produce at a sustained quality, at a sustained cost throughout the year. That is something that would have been unheard of uh, 10 years ago. That's yeah. fascinating. <laughs> Do you think that based on the these elements of success in Australia and, and, and even in, in Saudi with hydroponic farming, as you mentioned, would you have any advice for President Obama or the members of Congress negotiating the infrastructure package now? I mean, this seems to be an enormous opportunity to do exactly what you said, sort of spur some of these better, very physical, old world things. But if there is a moment where U.S. politics may be working better than it typically works and can get some of this done, what advice would you give about, about how to put some of the things that you talked about into uh, those lessons to be learned and enacted? You know, Matt, I think, I think that's a great question. And um, look, I'll probably give away my age here, right? But um, I've grown up consuming Western media, right? America was the beacon of freedom and democracy and where everyone wanted to be. I think the, the biggest shift I've seen in the last five, 10 years is, I don't know if that's because of media, because people are growing up, uh, that the American dream has been shattered for people outside of America. It is no longer seen as 
uh, the, the peak of hum human civilization. And Ray Dalio has a great book on sort of the rise and fall of civilizations and why that's happening. But I think in terms of, uh, you know, advice, uh, let me give an example. Uh, China has taken approximately $400 million, uh, 400 million uh, citizens out of poverty. Uh, they produce as many roads uh, in a year as the entire of the UK has in its totality. Uh, the kind of infrastructure execution that is that is organized is unprecedented. You know, the fact that I think that it's even a question that President Obama uh, and the leadership team have to negotiate uh, to, to get the infrastructure bill across is probably mm -hmm. the saddest thing uh, where, when you look at the state of the U.S. infrastructure already compared to what other countries are willing, other countries leaderships are willing to do to catch up or even get ahead. So um, I think... Um, to answer your question about a piece of advice, it's sad to say, but maybe it's time to, to look outside uh, to see what everyone else. And then this is probably something America's not something used to doing, uh, is looking outside to see what the leaders in the respective fields are doing and trying to copy and imitate it, which is something the world has been doing looking at America for the past 50 years. Um, mm. I hope that answers your question. And, uh, yeah. 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 yeah, it's a great point. I want to add another dimension here. When I was a kid, there were a lot of uh, TV programs about the house of the future, this of the future, whatever of the future. Being a designer, I know that part of our process is also showing a, a model, uh, showing an example. And mm -hmm. I do think that there is a pretty poor job in uh, providing the public with a, a, a literal vision of the future, how, it's con how it could look. And that possibly could support the political process in, in, in gaining support for uh, some radical new ideas. So uh, I do think that, for instance, we can uh, get support from the government for showing the house of the future and building a few examples and, 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 and celebrating it and getting the media out there and, and, and getting people to live in it and, and, and report back to the community how great it is. Uh, and I think this is something that was relegated in the last few decades only to the private sector. And I do think that the government uh, could do a, a much better job in a communication of that. Uh, you know, uh, China has its own way of doing things. It's not necessarily asking people what they want. Uh, I think in the U.S., uh, knowing how things are going here on the county, city, uh, state and, and, and federal level, it's going to be uh, impossible to do that uh, top down. So I think we need to create a, a bottom up movement of betterment. And that is something that could be done through uh, providing uh, great examples that are supported by the government, not by the private sector. Mm -hmm. and, and that creating a kind of a pent up demand bottom up. Got to say that again, supported by the government and not by the private sector. Did I, did I understand yeah, well, you correctly? Yeah, so uh, how do you create a, 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 a bottom-up movement for betterment of different areas, whether it's construction or food or whatever? Uh, the typical uh, formula today is using private money and private initiative. Um, mm -hmm. And I do think that there should be better access to government money to uh, uh, support these activities so you can create models of uh, innovation uh, bottom up that are still supported by the government. Currently, government is, is mm. relegated to two roles. One is legislation and the other one is infrastructure, more or less. Um, mm. So that's uh, something that we need to uh, reconsider here in the US because if you're looking for you know, a $2 million, $5 million uh, uh, support uh, other than the DOD, you, you, it's it's impossible to get it. Let's say, for instance, if you want to do the house of the future here in California, it's not something you get something you get any money from the from from the government here. Mm. So I'm just putting it out there that I think uh, the the government should play a role in changing the perception of the public and create a, a bottom up uh, wave of, of of innovation through support of a local. Bottom, uh, bottom, bottom up initiatives. It's a great point. I mean, Gotti, one thing I've thought about a lot is, you know, mayors are probably the closest we have in the government to a CEO. Uh, you know, yeah. some mayors are strong and actually have more power. Others are not. And, 
And it is pretty crazy that one of the few government institutions that have enough capital to throw around is is the three quarter of a trillion dollar U.S. Defense Department, where yeah. they were amazing at doing many, many things, but a lot of things with infrastructure that we are not what their specialty is. So we move into something else. Um, I, I know we have about 12 minutes left. It's been a really interesting discussion. We have some great folks in the room. Um, I would encourage if anyone's here, if you'd want to ask a question, please raise your hand and do so. While we wait for that, I, I want to take the, the conversation a little bit of a different direction as we start to wrap up. So, uh, Karan and, and, and Gadi, you know, we've been talking about the positive elements of what humanity can do or what technology can do to humanity. And I think we've settled on, you know, the very positive role of supply chains in the physical world, you know, talking about the role of healthcare, the role of uh, some of the elements that we've talked about with changing construction, the fabrication of houses. Um, I feel that the story of the promise of technology was very true 10 years ago. When I was in the Obama administration, for, for example, you know, you're working 14 hour days, everyone was exhausted. When people would leave the government and they worked on Wall Street, the thought was, well, you've sold out. But if you worked at Facebook or Google, well, you're just continuing the great work of the Obama administration, you know, in a place where you get free nut pods and free food out in the sunshine of Silicon Valley. I think that has changed now. Where we're starting to very much see the dark side of technology, of course. So, so to take it at a different note, for some of the negative effects of technology, what do you see as sort of the most pernicious that we're seeing now? And then the second part of the question, so we're not leaving this on a complete Debbie Downer note, are there new technological innovations that you see that can help overcome those and counteract that? So it's sort of technology is causing its own set of problems. And then how is technology a potential solution to mediate and, and address some of those? So I'm happy to go ahead with this one. Um, I think I'll start off with two of my favorite shows on Netflix at the moment, which are Black Mirror and Love, Death, and Robots. Um, <laughs> oh, but, I haven't seen either. I got to, I got to, uh, are they going to depress me or are they going to give me hope? They'll get you thinking for sure. Uh, okay. So I think, um, you know, w with both of those, you sort of see uh, what you were touched upon, the, uh, the negative aspects of technology. Now, I, I think I, I'd like to distill into like two buckets. One is, uh, the negative aspects of the business models around technology, uh, which you sort of I'd probably see with what social media has done in terms of been, been driven by human attention and human engagement as, as one aspect. And then there's the sort of negative aspect of actually discovering the technology, you know, the proverbial sort of Prometheus giving fire to the humans and then, you know, leading them to their own destruction. Uh, and that we can sort of see with the potential for, you know, uh, I think there's an article today. Uh, this week about um, the skirmish between the Turks and the Kurds that happened a couple of months ago and how that was the first ever human recorded use of autonomous AI being used to, to find and eliminate humans uh, from, a, from a defense perspective. Now, I think both equally um, have a detrimental effect, obviously, to our growth. Um, I think in one aspect, let's say the business model aspect, there is the possibility of human intervention, of government intervention, because mm -hmm. I guess governments are uh, the last representative of masses of humans, uh, where you know governments could come in and let's say I think what's happening with uh, the fangs at the moment, uh, with talks of regulation, um, but around the the sort of the AI controlled robots, you know, the Terminator esque uh, world we live in, or we're looking to live in the future. Um, I struggle to see anything that can overcome that other than collaboration, other than the understanding and maybe a sort of inter-country treaty uh, banning that like we've done for nuclear arms, like we've done for certain small weapons. Uh, that's essentially the solution um, when it comes down to it from my perspective is, is better engagement uh, on a high level, more government interaction and, and inter-country resolutions, which obviously has its own challenges. Um, Gary, I'd be curious as to your perspective from a design um, thing. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, um, you, you brought up AI and uh, autonomous uh, uh, technologies, and, and this is something I'm dealing with uh, on, on our vehicle side, and I, I want to take that as an example and extrapolate on the role of government. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I've seen in the last 30 years here in the Silicon Valley, uh, government is coming uh, late, 
typically in 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 uh, you know let's say in its role as a referee of what's happening on the field. Usually after the match is done uh, and 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 you know doesn't do much uh, other than maybe a slap on the wrist. I think we need to inject new people into government, people that are a lot more inquisitive and people that are mostly, uh, we need to change the laws. Uh, the fundamental element uh, in how uh, digital technology is working is uh, horizontal integration. This is a concept that is very difficult for the old industrial laws to understand. In the old industrial law, uh, we were used to uh, vertical integration. So, for instance, a car manufacturer will own the iron ore and, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and, and now we're talking about horizontal integration, uh, like uh, Apple's uh, App Store, where you have essentially, uh, you create a standard with thousands and thousands of people that uh, adhere to that standard and obviously uh, get a cut from that. So applying that to autonomous uh, vehicles or autonomous technology, I think uh, obviously this technology has a lot of benefits uh, on many levels, but the government is very um, uh, slow to act and, and actually uh, definitely um, uh, drinking the Kool-Aid about the speed in which technology like that could be uh, applied um, who is responsible, who is not responsible, and so on. And I do think we, the, the government just needs to be a lot more inquisitive, a lot more aggressive in that, including that's something fundamental, is to apply some criminality to some executive decisions. Mm. So if you call your... Yeah, I think that there are some elements, like if you call your car a uh, feature autopilot, you go to jail. Because you know, it's it's not autopilot. It's very simple. Sure. No. <laughs> there, yeah. there is actually such a thing as corporate criminal liability in, in the U.S. law, except it is just so rarely, uh, so rarely reused. So, you, so you'd be arguing for expanding the use of that. Uh, I'm, I'm as we have these new, more dangerous technologies. You know, laws through the civilization worked on on a very simple principle of intimidation. You, you, you need somebody uh, uh, getting it, uh, getting the stick in order to get uh, the hundred other guys to, to be uh, warned. And, and this not happen. This not happen. If it happens, usually it happens 10 years late. And by then, again, because of this horizontal integration nature of the digital technology, uh, the game is already done. Uh, so, so um, I, I'm 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 really baffled by by what is allowed sometimes to go, and this autopilot is only one uh, example. There are others as well. Uh, I could I could just spew them all. You know, now there are cars in in next to my studio in San Francisco uh, spewing radar uh, emission, standing in 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 in, in the red light. This is known to be harmful. It's clearly known to be harmful. It's like three feet away from the adjacent car and driver. It's, it's mind-boggling that these things go along and, and nobody calls it, nobody calls the shot, nobody says this is right, this is wrong. And, and then 10 years later, obviously, we'll, we'll face the consequences. So um, I think there is a problem with how the, the government works uh, as far as digital technology, uh, again, on two levels of perception of this horizontal integration factor and the speed and the ability to come down quickly and slap wrists uh, and sometimes slap more than wrists. And, and that's, I mean, th that's what happened to uh, the tech business. The tech business used to be, quote unquote, a good business. It's always been a ferocious business. But I think uh, too many um, uh, uh, self-serving interests uh, acted without enough of uh, restraint, and now we are uh, kind of ruined the business, if you wish. It's it's fascinating. Um, you know, let, why don't we do? Uh, is we have just a few minutes left? I'll just kind of do two last lightning rounds, and then anything else that that both of you would like to to add. And first of all, as we wrap up, I want to thank you both for really thoughtful and engaging panel. I think it's rare in a panel you, you have some new and interesting ideas, and I think we'd come to that. So, Gadi, as we wrap up, my question for you is, is you have a, a unique perspective as, as a design expert. As we think about these problems, we've kind of centered around what governments can do. 
Do you have like a piece of advice about how your experience in design, what a government leader who might be listening could learn from, from this as we're thinking about what technology can do to address some of these massive problems we've been talking about? I, I think on, on a global level, I think uh, government tends to be um, out of the uh, tactical business, if you wish, of showing examples on, on doing things. And I do think the government should have a role in designing uh, examples and uh, bringing it to market for market to see uh, uh, the benefits and continue uh, evolving some ideas like that. Uh, and it used to be the case, by the way, we tend to forget that the Internet uh, started from government, was a very tactical move. <laughs> so we, we, we need that role um, again, again, outside the DOD. And I think design practices that are creating uh, a, a clear vision, like showing a beautiful example or uh, promoting, uh, you know, sustainable food and so on, could be done uh, by pointed uh, key case studies, if you wish, that are supported by government rather than uh, the way it is um, uh, done now through uh, private government, uh, private money. Uh, so. That's my, um, my high level. Or a second observation, as I just mentioned this in terms of refereeing, uh, government needs to be a lot more felt uh, in the ground level of, of steer, uh, steering where technology go, uh, both on the, you know, preventing bad things from happening and, 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 and also showing the good things that could happen. Got it. Well, look, we have actually reached at the, uh, 815. So Kron, I will give you uh, the last word and then we will uh, then we will conclude. Thanks. Thanks, man. I think for my last words, I'd like to thank both of you um, for your time. I think, uh, you know, I've done one of these panels before and um, this is, has to be the best one yet. Thank you for uh, sharing your experiences and I'm definitely keen on uh, engaging in the future to see uh, what we could work on. Um, in terms of last moments, I guess, uh, just looking at a comment uh, a viewer had made on how technology can encourage shared um, access across the globe, uh, at least that's how I've taken it in terms of shared human experience. I think one thing we found, uh, and going back to that, that example I gave of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, you know, the only differences between us gents, and someone sitting in Africa or in India in a remote village has fundamentally been access to technology. You know, through access to the internet or electricity, they can uh, gather information, educate themselves, create products and solutions, even give insight on policy. Um, so I think when I think to answer that question on how technology can help us realize what is common over what is separate, uh, it is being able to share ideas and perspectives uh, on platforms and forums like we are doing on today. Right. Well, again, thank you both for both our uh, presenters. It was terrific meeting and I look forward to uh our paths cross again soon at the conference and beyond. Have a great time, everyone. Thank you very much, Karan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.